Welcome to our church. I thought it was Jesus. It is. He's included in that hour. Oh, okay. <laughs> Good morning. Thanks for coming out today on this beautiful fall day. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, this morning we're so thankful that we have a place to call home. And that home has nothing to do with where we lay our head at night. It's where we lay our heart, and that's in you. Lord, as we gather here today, we ask you to be with Alan as he brings the message. And Lord, just help us to concentrate on the cross this morning. Concentrate on the ultimate sacrifice that you paid. And we give all the glory and honor to you. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Oh, that's right. I'm waiting to hear Val over here. Yeah, Val's not with us today. Everybody stand up. Let's, let's praise the Lord with some music.
Blessed be your name this morning, oh God. With all the chaos and confusion, the pain and suffering, the, the heartache, the fear. Lord, all that we're feeling these days, we just need to cry out that blessed be your name. Lord, you are blessed among us, and you bless us in more ways than we could ever deserve or even imagine. Lord, there are those that aren't with us today for whatever reason, Lord, for sickness. Or just not able to get out because of fear. Lord, we ask you to be with those people. Be with us that are watching online today, Lord. Help them to know that you love them. Help them know that we love them. And Lord, just help us to remember that all we have to do is honor your commandment to love. Lord, we just ask you to continue to bless us today. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Everybody give a high and healthy handshake or hand wave to everybody around.
be seated. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. We are today going to be in James chapter 4. But in order to get there, we're going to start in the Old Testament and go all the way through to Revelation and come back. So just hang on to yourself this morning. How many of y'all are on Facebook? Me too. <laughs> I... Uh, I know that if I post something on Facebook that somebody doesn't like, I'm going to get backlash. Well, this week it was brought to my attention that last week that because of political opinions on Facebook, these are not my political opinions, not my post, a person that does not attend our church and has never had a conversation with me other than to say hello. Doubts that everyone is truly welcome in our church. Yes. Yes. I normally would not even respond to this, but it was not posted on Facebook. It was actually sent as a text message. And my name was, in, it was mentioned in there. So, like I said, I normally wouldn't even give this a second thought, but I decided that... Since my name was mentioned, then I should address this biblically. Ooh, be good. Yes. <laughs> A few weeks back, I decided to limit my time on Facebook just because of this reason. And uh, this person said, I pray for my family, which does attend our church, that their mind... That they open their mind and find a church that truly represents the heart of Jesus. <laughs> the first and least important thing I want to address is they referred to just Jesus Community Church as Allen's Church. It's not my church. It is not my church. It has never been my church. In 2011, under the direction of God and with Christian counseling, I planted a church. At that time... Not a lot of people are cut out to do house churches, you know, startup churches. So we actually had a loosely formed church council. And it was loosely formed because some people were deciding we don't want to be in a church. We want a house church. We want to go somewhere that's, you know, already established. And that's fine. But now we have a formal church council. We have elected church officers. And uh, this is God's church. Amen. Uh, I actually am accountable to the church council and to the elected church uh, 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 the people here. And I am, uh, for all parties concerned, an employee of this church that can be fired at any minute. So it's not my church. It's God's church. It's our church. I am the spiritual leader of the church. And uh, you would be hard-pressed to find another church that is more, that adequately represents the heart of Jesus, as this church does. Amen. And uh, what's happening here is we have competing, competing views on this subject, and both competing views are claiming to be Christians. Amos 3.3 3 asks the question, Do two walk together unless they have agreed to do so? Does two people walk together unless they have agreed to do so? Well, this church agrees to love and walk hand in hand with anybody that chooses to be a part of our fellowship. We do not judge anybody for their political beliefs, their race, their gender, their sexual preference, or, or anything else. 
We don't judge them, but we do preach from the Bible. We preach the Word of God, and some of these things just don't line up with Scripture. One of these days, God's going to judge us all because we're all sinners. The church that these people want to see, or this particular person, there's more than one. This just happens to be the one that I'm addressing because they were the one who sent the text message. This, this person wants to see a church where it's acceptable to abort your child but not to spank them. They want a church where it's more acceptable for a man to have a husband than it is for Jesus to be mentioned in school. You will be accepted here regardless of your beliefs. You don't even have to be a believer to come to this church. As a matter of fact, we welcome non-believers in our church. You can belong before you believe. That's what our video says. But we will not be accepted at your church unless we believe like you. This is called, Bud knows this, it's called exclusion by assimilation. Which means that you're all welcome here, but only if you change your values, your core beliefs, and make them like ours. As long as you dress up on a suit, with a suit and tie on Sunday morning like we do. As long as ladies do not wear pants in church like we do. You're welcome at this church anytime. Psalm 133.1 says, How good and pleasant it is when brothers live together in unity. We would love to live with you in unity. But instead of letting Jesus unify us, you're letting political beliefs divide us. Nothing has been ever been made better. Nothing has ever been made better by changing laws. Things get made better by people changing themselves. In the big scheme of things, it doesn't matter who's in the White House. It doesn't matter who's in Congress. It doesn't matter who's on the Supreme Court. Because this country and this whole earth actually is only a temporary institution. It's not going to matter who's in the White House when Jesus comes back. Second Peter 3 Verses 10 and 11 it says, But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar, and elements will be destroyed by fire, and the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives. We need to be living holy and godless li godly lives, folks. Christian virtues such as kindness, concern, loving your neighbor, and just doing good in general is tossed aside because of politics. And because of belief that Christians are the bad guys. <laughs> Romans 13, 1 and 2. Everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, he who rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, and those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. God's word compels us to obey authorities. Not just the ones we vote for, but the one that the country has voted for and was duly appointed, you know, it's not up to us to agree with whoever's in political office.
But one day, someone's going to be up there, and they're going to rebel against God. This is already in the works. It's going to happen. It might not be 2020 election. It might not be 2024. It might be on down the line. But it's already started. It's going to happen. And what happens, if you want to turn over to Revelation chapter 13, starting in verse 11. Revelation 13, starting in verse 11. It says, Then I saw another beast coming out of the earth. He had two horns like a lamb. A lamb is a little meek animal. The kids love to touch, love to play with because they're so meek and innocent. But he spoke like a dragon. He exercised all his authority of the first beasts on his behalf and made the earth and all its inhabitants worship the first beast whose fatal wound has been healed. Now, if you look up in, uh, in chapter 12 in verse 5, it talks about this first beast. This beast was given a mouth to utter proud words and blasphemies and to exercise his authority for 42 months, which is three and a half years. He opened his mouth to blaspheme God and to slander his name and his dwelling place and those who live in heaven. He was given power to make war against the saints and to conquer them. And he was given authority over every tribe and people and nation and language. All inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast. All whose names have not been written in the book of life belonging to the Lamb will be slain from the creation of the world. That's this first beast. That's what he's going to be. Back down in 2 chapter in 13, uh, verse 13, he says, And he performs great and miraculous signs, causing even fire to come down from the heaven uh, to earth to, view, to full view of men. Because of the signs he was given power to do so on behalf of the first beast, he deceived the inhabitants of the earth. He ordered them to set up an image in honor of the beast who were wounded by the sword and yet lived. He was given power to breath to give breath to the image of the first beast so that it could speak and cause all those who refused to worship the image to be killed. He also forced everyone, small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on his right hand or his forehead so that no one could buy or sell unless he had the mark, which is the name of the beast, which is the number of his name. This calls for wisdom. If anyone has insight, let him calculate the number of the beast for the man's number. His, uh, man's number. his number is 666. We have already seen corporations in our country implanting chips in their employees. See, all this that was written 2,000 years ago, some of it four and 5,000 years ago, it's all true. It's all coming to fruition, and we're watching it right now. This is going on right now. We're set up to worship false idols. There are churches out there right now preaching what this person wants to hear. Not what he needs to hear. I'm not going to preach what people want to hear. I'm going to preach what God says to preach. I'm going to preach the word of God. And let's look over in James chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. It says, What causes fights and quarrels among you? Do they come from your desires to battle within you? You want something, but do not get it. You kill and covet, but you cannot have what you want. You quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. These folks are letting that battle within them, their desires within them. They want to be a Christian, but they don't want to give up their earthly beliefs. They want to continue living an ungodly life, but they want to go to heaven when they die. When the word of God is preached, it calls out that worldly behavior. And that's why they think they're not welcome in this church. It's not my word we're preaching up here. It's not Bud's word we're preaching up here. We're preaching the word of God. Whether you like it or not, God says it in the Bible. The Bible is true. The Bible is proved years and years, time and time again, that everything written here is true. When the Old Testament was written, it was written as a book of prophecy. Now it's a book of history because all those prophecies have happened. The Bible's clear about these false prophets. 
And we have a whole generation now that are calling for false prophets to be preaching. Because they won't leave church feeling good about themselves. They won't hear, they won't have the best of both worlds. God has warned us, folks, and we're seeing it now. We're seeing it happen right now. Verses 3 and 4. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. You adulterous people, don't you know the fellowship with God is hatred towards God? Fellowship with the world is, is, is hatred towards God. Anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes the enemy of God. Spiritual adultery is being married to Christ and loving the world. Married to Christ and loving the world. Folks, we are the bride of Christ. It's just like being married to your spouse and loving someone else. It's wrong. Matthew says you will recognize them by their fruit. He says that because a bad tree can't bear good fruit. When you surrender to the flesh, you choose to become friends with the world. And that makes you spiritually unfaithful. You know, God is truly disturbed when we do this, but He's disturbed for our sake. Not disturbed for his sake. He's disturbed for our sake. Because he wants to draw us back to him. He wants to draw us to the truth. He wants to draw us to the word. He don't want us out here living in the world. We're not of this world. We're just passing through. Like we read, this, this world is just here for a, a limited time. This is, a, this is a limited run show here. It's not going to go on forever. <laughs> but for the time being, God is not responding with his punishment. He is not responding with his punishment right now. Right in verse 6 it says, Because he gives more grace. This is why the scripture said God opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble. Right now, he's responding with more grace. He wants to lead us back to him. He don't want to give us what we deserve. And I'm not saying that I'm any better than this person that sent this text because I'm not. I'm a sinner too. I have to, uh, to go to God every day just like everybody else should. And repent of my sins. I don't sin because I want to sin. I sin because I'm human. That's I'm right. sin because I have a heart made of flesh. But I don't want to be a spiritual adulterer. I don't want to love anything more than I love God. I don't want to love anything more than I love Jesus. Just like I don't want to love any woman like I love my wife. We are the bride of Christ, folks. It's only pride that keeps us from responding to His grace. That pride also keeps us from enjoying His blessings. Verse 7 says, Submit yourself then to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. That pride I mentioned is what is the devil's main tool. He takes every advantage of it. He takes every advantage of that pride. But God's grace has so much more to offer than the devil has. As Christians, we must use the word of God to, uh, to resist Satan. When we use the, God to resist, use the word of God to resist Satan, the Holy Spirit will work in us, and he'll make that happen. Because God cannot help a Christian who is proud. It's okay to be proud of your kids. It's okay to be proud of your spouse. It's okay to be proud of a compliment you've made. As long as they don't interfere with God. 
as long as you don't let that pride interfere with what God's doing, you have to humble yourself. So if you refuse to humble yourself and repent, that's the only way he can help you if you do that. And we can only resist the devil by first submitting to God. I said I wanted to address this claim biblically, and I think I've done so. As Christians, we're accountable to God. We're called to be good citizens. Unless all Christians, not just some Christians, unless all Christians are right with God, there will never be unity. James calls out three warnings here for the Christians on the left, on the right, and in the middle. If you're a Christian, he's called out these three warnings for you, verse, starting in verse 7 again. Submit yourself <clears throat> then to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before God, and he will lift you up. Brothers, do not slander one another. Anyone who speaks against his brother or judges him speaks against the law and judges it. When you judge the law, you are not keeping it, but you're sitting in judgment of it. There is only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and destroy. But you, who are you to judge your neighbor? He's talking about the warning of pride right there. <clears throat> Wars and fighting originate in pride. Pride distances, distances us from God. Pride defiles our hearts. It defiles our works. The sin of being double-minded is basically the lack of submission to God. In these four verses right here, there are three commands that are not only imperative, they're calling for an immediate action in humbling ourselves before God. That is submit. We submit to God. We resist we come near. We wash and purify ourselves. We grieve and mourn and wail. We change. And most of all, we humble ourselves. Together, they picture a complete turnaround from spiritual immaturity and unfaithfulness. Verses 11 and 12. said, brothers, you are not to slander one another. Anyone who speaks against his brother or judges him speaks against the law and judges it. When you judge the law, you're not keeping it, but setting in judgment of it. There is one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and destroy, but you who are in judge, you who are to judge your neighbor. That's a warning against judging, against judgment. When people are worldly minded and prideful, they're often quick to judge others. James warns us here not to speak out or criticize against one another. There's been so many churches divided over hateful and critical words. In chapter 2, verse 8, James refers to the royal law. The royal law, James says, is love your neighbor as yourself. This law is broken when there's criticism or judgment of other Christians. He points out that the one who judges is setting themselves above the law. There's only one lawgiver. There's only one judge. He's the sole judge on how it is kept and how it is broken. Verses 13 says, Now listen, you who say, Today or tomorrow, you will go... To this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money. Why, you don't even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord's will, if it's the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast and brag. All such boasting is evil. It's a warning here against arrogance. Arrogance and self-confidence. There's nothing wrong with being confident in yourself as long as you're not arrogant about it. Pride, criticism, and arrogance go hand in hand. 
James is referring, referring to those who boast on what they're going to do, how they, they boast, we're going to go to this city over here, we're going to start this big corporation, we're going to uh, get everything and we're going to come back wealthy. He warns that this boasting of self-confidence is very dangerous. We know nothing about tomorrow. Life is uncertain. As firefighters down in Clayton had no idea when they went on a call one time or when somebody came into contact with someone else that 17 members would get COVID and one of them would pass away. Life is uncertain. We don't know when our lives is going to end. So how can we certain, be certain about what we're going to do tomorrow? So many people make plans without praying or seeking the mind of God. I'm going to leave this last verse for those that judge us but claim to know the true heart of Christ, the true heart of Jesus. Verse 17 says, Anyone then who knows the good he ought to do and doesn't do it, sins. If you're truly a Christian, you know what you're supposed to do. If you continue to sit in judgment because of your pride and arrogance, God will judge you for your sins. If you continue on this path, one day you're going to turn away from God. You're going to follow the devil right into hell. I want to ask you right now, wherever you are, if you're in this building, if you're watching on Facebook, if you're watching on YouTube, website, wherever you are. Our church is not going to judge you. Our church is going to walk together with you, just like the Bible tells us to do. But we've got to unify. We've got to come into one accord. We've got to let Jesus unify us, not let politics divide us. I have dear friends that are, that are the polar opposite of me politically. And yet we can still have conversations. We can still be civil. We can still be good friends. If you don't know what it's like to Be comfortable knowing that this world is only going to be here for a short amount of time. And one of these days, Jesus is coming back. And this world is going to burn. It's going to burn like garbage in a 50-gallon drum. If you're not ready for that, I'd like to offer you this opportunity to accept Jesus into your life. It's the best decision I've ever made. It's the only decision I've ever made that really turned out perfect. Right now, all you got to do, we just read where the Bible it says tomorrow is uncertain. We don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. But the Bible does say today is the day of salvation. If everyone would please close your eyes, bow your heads, and do looking around. I'm not going to ask anyone to lift their hand or, or walk up here or anything. I'm just going to ask you to think about a time when you've accepted Jesus as your Savior. I want to you, you to reflect back on your life and then I want you to reflect forward until the time of your death and see if you know 100% beyond a shadow of a doubt if you died right now, you'd go to heaven. If you don't know that, if you're 99.9% .9 pure, sure that you're going to Go to heaven, then you're 100% wrong. Right now, wherever you're at, I'd like for you to just pray this simple prayer. Pray, God, I know I'm a sinner and I need a Savior. Right now, I want to turn away from my sins and follow Jesus. I want to confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord. 
God, if there's one here that within the sound of my voice that has prayed that prayer today, God, right now I pray that you will start discipling them, that you will turn them their lives around, and most of all, God, you will comfort them with your peace. And not the so-called peace we think the world offers. Lord, we love you and we thank you for what you're doing right here on our corner. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Tommy, will you pass the hat for us? We have some things coming up here. Um, but tell us about the, the pact. P-A-C-T. Yeah, we have... Uh a microphone that doesn't work. 14. There we go. Yeah. yeah. Hey. Um, on October the 10th, there's a Saturday at Avisboro Baptist Church. Uh, we have been invited to, to participate <coughs> in an event put on by Garner Police called Police and Community Together, PACT. And they're only inviting churches to set up tents, share Jesus. And the community is welcome to come out and hear about all the churches and the police department in town. I should have a flyer this week, and I'll share it uh, with those on Facebook. I'll have Alan put it on, and we'll have flyers here for next Sunday. But it should be a good day to show people just what Alan was just talking about, that, you know, we are the church, and we do welcome everybody. Also, we have a tentative date for the yard sale fundraiser, which is going to be Halloween, the 31st. Uh, we will know more in the next week or so. It'll be right here in the parking lot. Uh, if that date doesn't work out, we'll we'll have another date before uh, before too long. But yeah, kind of pencil it on your calendars. We'll have a yard sale. We don't do clothes, no clothes. Uh, but we will hopefully we will have breakfast biscuits like we did last year. Maybe hot dogs and hamburgers. We don't know yet. We're going to work on that. But it'll be a great fundraiser for the church and. Uh, also, if you're all listening out there on Facebook, we, we, uh, we, we covet your prayers and, and your finances if you can help us. You can go to www.j2c2.org, and we have a place for online giving. We now have five acres of land we had to pay for and hopes to put a building on there soon. So we appreciate uh, all the help we can get. Um, Bible study will be this Wednesday, 6 and 7 again at Sheila's. And... Tuesday, October 13th, we're going to try to have a church supper again. At where are we going to? At Carolina Barbecue. So we'll have to sit in, in tables of six or eight. I don't know how many it is, but we'll all be able to get together and fellowship over a meal again. And it's been a long time coming. And if you've never been to one, we hope you'll make it. Um, one more thing. Why? Jackie. Jackie is having surgery tomorrow. She fell and broke her wrist. So we need to remember Lewis and Jackie. And I, I know she'll be prayed for because I think that uh, Lewis will take care of that. Yeah. <clears throat> no. Me too. I ain't we, can, good nurse. We, we can slip some prayers in there among his, though. But, but yes, definitely pray for Jackie. Pray for Lewis, her caregiver. Oh. You know. <laughs> Oh, that's, I think that's everything we have today. Let's sing a song. <laughs> Help us to be a sanctuary for a lost and dying world. Jesus, we thank you for being our sanctuary. Yes. A place we can go when we're hurt. 
when we're troubled, when we're confused, when we're just downhearted, Lord. God, as we leave here today, I pray that you'll put someone in our path that we can tell about Jesus, mm -hmm. that we can invite to our church, it, Lord. Lord, that we can bring to you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Y'all love each other. <laughs>